Strong Dads wants to thank 4Speed on 50 for sponsoring today's show. If you like classic cars, great food, and a taste of Americana, you have to visit 4Speed on 50's Diner. Located on Route 50 in Lawrenceburg, Indiana. Stop in today for a meal and an experience you won't soon forget at 4 Speed on 50's Diner. Welcome to Strong Dads. This is Merle Hutchinson alongside of Carl Andre, and we are bringing you part two. two. Part two uh, of part, our show of what does it mean to be a good worker? How to be a good worker. And then this one, we want to talk more, a little bit more heavily about how to advance yourself. Yeah how, yeah. how to get the higher fruit on the tree, hopefully. Yeah. So like part one, guys, we spent the time really talking about some of the different issues that we see. I think some of them could be generational. Some of them could just be uh, some family dynamic or, or that's that didn't allow some of the fostering of work ethic and habit that we've seen maybe in the past. Uh, you mentioned in the last show pressure and, and you know, uh, pressures have changed in our culture. Um some for the good, some for the bad, but some pressure is needed, yeah. right, to a level that it pushes you to to strive to be better, right? right. And so we, that was last show. Check out that last show. But we're going to get into part two today, and then part two we are going to talk about. Well, now what can we actually do, right? We have this yeah. rule: you only get to complain so long. Then you got to bring some solutions. Yeah, bring so some solutions. Today's going to be a lot of like, okay, so what can we actually hand these guys that's going to definitely uh, uh, open up opportunity to improve their lot. Well, that's it. What you just said there too reminds me of the a saying I use a lot. Happiness is not knowing who to blame. Yeah. So if you're not getting what you want in life for the most part, and I want to say God's in control and I understand, but God tends to favor work. Yeah. And he tends to favor integrity, which is another word for being a good employee. Mm -hmm. And if you're being paid to work, you should work. I mean, that sounds so obvious, but to so many people mm. find ways not to work at work. You know, mm. and, and they may even look busy. I'll, I'll, let me t touch on that real quick. One of the things, if you're going to advance, I, I believe, is learning the balance between uh, what's good enough. And I don't like the term, mm. oh, that's good enough. But what I was taught early on in our profession, there are two most expensive wastes of money, and that is an engineer, usually a young engineer right out of college, mm. who tolerances things too tight. When mm. plus or minus a quarter inch would work, and they've got a thousandth, which right. is really, really small if you don't know what that is. And then somebody like me who overbuilds it. Mm. So if you've got something that's supposed to look really good, polishing the inside of that is not, is not mm. practical. Right. But you'd be surprised. So if you want to be productive, you've got to strike that balance between where, how you produce mm. an excellent uh, end result. Right but not overdo it. And that goes all the way down through the chain. Yeah. But unfortunately, I'll say this, there are a few workers that there's a type of workers that I've identified and that's the person who chooses to polish the inside. Mm. They look busy, mm -hmm. but they're doing meaningless work, work that's not really necessary, yeah. but they're comfortable doing that. So they're doing that all day mm. long. Yeah. And that's the kind of, that's, I'm busy. I'm busy. Yeah. I'm working, you yeah. know, and then you got to corral them around. But yeah, there are people like that. So integrity is doing the job and working and doing what is profitable, what is mm -hmm. practical. That's that's a great point. You know, it, you, I ha I can't not bring this up. How much do you think this? Oh. If you're if you're not uh, watching and you're listening, I'm holding up a cell phone. How much has the cell phone distracted? And, and I would like to be holier than thou on this, but I'm just telling you, that little phone is is popping. I, I don't ever keep my ringer on, but the vibrator's there. Yeah. And uh, just through the course of the day, whether, whether you text me, my wife texts me, like just the fact that I check that and then my squirrel brain can take minutes yes. to go down that. I just would hate to know what it costs what I'm stealing from the company, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but very dangerous. And of course we know people who can scroll all day at work. Right. right? We had one like that. <clears throat> yeah. And he did it point just right out in front of everybody. Yeah. yeah. And, and <clears throat> for hours. Yeah. You know, uh and then what I talked about in the first show, if you're a if you're a, a shaker and a mover, 
you see something like that, it really can erode you if you're not working for the Lord. Right. You know, you, yeah. you say. And one of the things you talked in the first show about not feeling like it, a long time ago, there were there are a lot of aspects of work that I'm not crazy about. I mean, everybody has like that. Like work? Yeah. <laughs> but I always look at it and say, you know, this is my home payment. Mm-hmm. This is the car. This is, we don't drive, I, my, I drove my truck over here today. It's got 315,000 miles <laughs> on it or something. We were never big on cars. We take great vacations. So I always looked at my job and, you know, those, those hours and things like that. I didn't look at it as a job per se. I looked at it as my, as my what I call dream machine, what was making my yeah. dream machine work. So it always, it, I don't know if that's a tactic, but it helped me to to not look at the stuff that was right in front of me that was tedious or the minutia or, or just not fun and say this is your vacation yeah and yeah it, and it, it it's not it's not the job at that point it's the bigger it's the bigger call yeah um you're working on a mindset change there so yeah but you know one of the things you just mentioned too about the phone uh and i've been guilty of especially since moms have been in the home and uh we get i get calls from hospice and things so I, i'm gonna take them um but I have a rule that, that that we have a new owner, and I don't think he's completely online with this yet. I don't think he really understands it. I I look at a job and I go, and, I, and this is how I attack it. What's the part I don't like the most, or is going to be the most difficult? And I'm going to get that out of the way as soon as mm-hmm. possible, because <laughs> as long as it's lingering out there, I'm only working at half speed on these. Right. I don't know if that makes sense or not. We call that around here: eat your peas first. Eat the peas first. Get yep. the peas out of the way. Yep. But on top of that, I have a rule: once I engage in something, I'm staying on it. Mm-hmm. I'm going to stay on that straight through, because I found that once you interrupt for anything, oh yeah, it takes <clears> you. <throat> Mm. No, depending on what you're doing, it may take you an hour to yeah. get back to where you were yep. if you stop and go do something else. So I'm I'm kind of a, a butt that way. I'm I'm on it. I, I'm going to do this aspect, tee it up, knock it out, and then I'm going to go on. So yeah. that is a if you are one of these people that meanders around and thinks, well, I can do multitask. I'm a multitasker. My life, my wife will tell you, I'm a multitasker, and I can do things that way. But I am lightning fast. I, I'm not saying that to, to be boastful. When I'm in the groove on something, completely focused on it, I can't be beaten. I mm-hmm. know that's a big thing, at least in our environment. I'm not saying that yeah. there aren't people, but I have to be in that to do that. And these distractions like the phone, conversations, oh, yeah. there are people that you have to kind of rally or corral. Mm-hmm. You know, figure yeah. out how to, because there's people who will walk up and want to tell you everything about their life from the night before. Right. Every day we had one like that, and you've got to you've got to figure out tactics peacefully to to kind of lock yeah. that out. Let's leave that for the lunch, the break room, whatever. But let's stay at work. Yeah, you you say you're a multitasker. I am not, and that that's um, uh, Linda is. She's a multitasker, and I have realized I'm not. When I get on a task, like if she asks me to do anything else, <laughs> I get mad. I, like that butt that you talked about, I'm yeah. like, what, what do you want me to do here? Like, yeah. this is where my laser is. And so, and provided I can do that, I, I'm, I'm solid, I'm a good worker, and I get things done, and I think better, right? Yeah. Like I'm on task, yeah. I, I problem solve better. Um, but if I get three or four different distractions, I feel like I get none of them done well. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, so yeah. uh, I think those who can multitask and still be efficient and good, like that's amazing. Uh, that's not me. My brain is like on or off towards tasks. And you use the term efficient and good. The, the studies show that you are more effective. Even when you think you're a multitasker and good at it, you're more effective when you focus. Yeah. Um, that that and I can do multitasking, Linda. When we would cook around the house, it's it's noticeable right away. I mean, I've it's just there's a complete difference between us. But the studies show that you are more effective, and you can be good as a multitasker, or you can be great. Yeah. And I think that's the difference we're talking about here. You know, sometimes when you get to a certain level of ability and things like that, the differences are so small. Mm-hmm. And what we're talking about, I, I'm going to say something here that may not be popular. You're in competition. Mm. 
you're not only in, in today, at least in our environment, you're not only in competition with a fellow worker because there's there's other studs. There are you're not you know if you're going to be a stud, mm -hmm. it, there are going to be other studs, and there are only so many opportunities. And there's only so much money to go around. Right. But the reality is, you're competing today against somebody across the pond. Somebody in Asia wants your job. Yeah. Somebody in Asia wants your work that you're doing. And they're willing to do it for less and things like that. So we, we, there was an era where we didn't want to have competition, you know, mm -hmm. just give everybody a participation trophy. You're in competition. So that last 10% uh, or something like that, that's a dogfight for yeah. the most part. And you're in a dogfight, whether you realize it or not, you're in a dogfight. If you're in a call center, they're over in the Philippines now. If you're in a data center, those are moving someplace else. There's so many things I can uh, Carl, uh, you we hear the complaining of that. Yeah, but that's not going to go away. It's not and, going and away. Our, and I'll say in this in our capitalistic nope. free market country we live in, nope. because at the end of the day, people are always shopping for cheapest priced. Right. Right. And so, well, that's not fair. Buy American. At the end of the day, listen, I love all those ideas too, but at the end of the day, uh, if I've got fifty dollars in my wallet, I'm going to get everything I can. Out of that fifty dollars, that's, right. that's right, and that's what drives these things, and that's why, like, I you know, look at this, like, whether it's uh, you know Hispanic workers coming and doing landscaping or roofing or or starting to own those businesses. No, I tell, will. I tell my sons, like, guys, you can complain all you want, but the consumer is going to continue that's to right. get the best value that's out right. of their worker and product, and as long as you, if you keep fighting that, you're going to be the one unemployed and whining about it, right. And, and I think that's missed. Uh, you know, the people, and I, I, while we're on that topic, sort of, I said in the first one, companies aren't evil necessarily. There are some, I'm sure, and, and owners aren't necessarily evil. But you do not realize, I'm going to say, if you're an employee, you don't realize what it takes mm. to make something work. And, and that's so often forgotten. You know, oh, they're getting rich and everything like that. You know, the owner of our company that, that just sold, he, he put his house on the line. Oh, yeah. Didn't take a check <clears throat> during mm -hmm. lean times, mm -hmm. you know. He's taken all the risk and everything like that. So it's really tough to get anything up and running. So when you're out there playing armchair manager or armchair owner, you understand you don't have the full picture. It's right. a dog fight. Mm -hmm. It really is. And almost any <clears throat> business you're in, unless you've got a really unique patent and things and but even that if it's profitable there's going to be pressure on that so it's a dog fight and you're a dog fight as an employee yeah you, you know with somebody maybe not your co-workers because they may all be lazy but there's somebody out here across the pond or even in this country that's looking to get that work so i just love watching a young guy um who recognizes a trade or a skill that he has and he's just blind to the idea that there's anything but success coming his way because he, uh, he were, you know, uh, Jordan Peterson says one of the, one of the best indicators of success is, uh, intelligence. That's mm -hmm. one of them. Okay. And, and, and that I, can be measured in a lot of different ways. Right. Yeah. Or a couple yeah. different ways. At yeah. Least. But I would, uh, I would push back. I wouldn't throw that away at all, but I would push back. I'll take work ethic all day, every day. I mean, intelligence helps me direct well, they, the pathway. They yeah. gotta be tied it, together. Yeah, yeah. but man, I, you take a guy who's learned a basic trade or skill, and he's like, I'm up before the sun, and I and they work. I've seen guys in the roofing world do that. I've seen guys pouring concrete do that. And they're just like, listen, I don't know a lot about a lot of things, but I know how to do this. And the next thing you know, they're the ones driving the big trucks. Yeah. They're the ones having the home. You're yeah. like, wow. Yeah. that guy's a worker and i just love seeing that stuff because it's like uh, you we talked about in the first show there's still plenty of opportunity plenty of opportunity. plenty of opportunity and don't even buy into that garbage that you can't make it anymore right and i'd say right now i've been saying it for 20 years to, through financial peace the great opportunity right now is in skilled trades mm. because yep. uh the ai and things like that aren't mm. going to be able to fix your furnace yep you know so a lot of these jobs are going to go overseas they're just going to go if you're in a computer-based job you can bet there's that competition we were just talking about is fierce. But on that note, my one of the great influences in my life that I wish I had spent more time with was my great uncle Shorty. His name is L.R. Chapman. He was out of Tell City, Indiana. 
and he had a sixth grade education. He ended up in the White House having uh, lunch or some breakfast or whatever it was with John Kennedy, and he was the <laughs> local boy done good and everything like that. I asked him one time, I said, Shorty, how did you do what you did? And he said, when I was in sixth grade, I went to work as a shoveling gravel into a hopper on a construction site. And he said, I watched the hopperator all day long, and I've watched everything he did, and I stayed after and even learned the machine a little bit better, and I became the hopper operator. And he said, I did that with the next position in line all the way to the top of the company, then I quit and started my own. <laughs> and I thought, you know, it's such a simple idea that, that if you want to advance, you know, and you're in a company where there's advancement, not every, not every place has advancement, but if you want to to take something else on. I was so blessed to have mentors, mm. men who spoke into my life, the two men that took me under their wing and taught me at an early age. When I was headed for college and they said, you know, it's a long story, but they, 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 and we'll, we'll probably talk about that here in a minute too, some of their principles, but they spoke into my life and, and seeing that's such a simple process. What's next in line? What are the responsibilities for that? What all does that mean? What do I need to have to do that, that's, you could literally walk your way up a oh, chain yeah. Yeah. that way just by paying attention yeah. and and then finding people in that company that are willing to mentor you. There's almost always an older guy or somebody, an older person who's going to be leaving or whatever. Or if you are a stud, I use that term a lot. If you're a stud, they want their company to do good. They want their department to do good. Mm -hmm. and they're going to pour their energy into you as long as you're willing to, to rise to the occasion. Yeah. Well, I look at that, you know, spent some years uh, running races and bike races and stuff. And sometimes, if, especially I was always, I would just say average at those things, but I did them for recreation. And you learn very quickly, you're not that great. <laughs> You're not that great, right? <laughs> it's like the high school pro or an all-star that yeah. goes to college and gets his butt cream because yeah. it's like, oh, wow. I, w I was great back at high school, yeah, right? in a small pond. Yeah, but if, but if you want to stay in the game, you learn to race to the guy, the next guy in front of you, right? So I'm out on the course, and I'm like, you know, <laughs> first, I don't even know where first is, but this guy here, I can get he's him. 20 yards in front of me. Yeah. And so that's becomes my laser, right? Like, yeah. okay, am I closing that gap? Am I closing that gap? And then, you know, again, somebody's doing that behind you. You're in somebody else's view, right? So, but that whole idea with that, your competitive nature is I don't need to always think about the win. I need to think about the pathway, right? The, yeah. How do I get further along and improve myself? Those steps, so. which is what we talked about in the first video. <clears throat> I, I think it was, what, you know, how people... They don't feel like working or they feel lost or they're not motivated because they don't know the steps. Well, the steps are there. I mean, they're right. there. And if you, and, and again, you got to ask for a lot of things in life. If you, if you have a desire or there's something that you want to do, you, you got to ask a lot of times for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's anyway. Yeah, let, let's get Carl to some of the different principles. Yeah. Uh, some of the things that we can say without a doubt this is going to uh, better your lot in life, open up opportunities, and uh, and ultimately, you know, give you the best chance. So well, what are some things that you've got? Recap from the first video, there's no committee to meet, meeting to make your life better. So you need to take the initiative. If there's a skill in your, in your workforce and we're looking at that next position, if it's Excel or something you need to learn, go do it. Don't wait mm -hmm. for the company to supply that. Take the extra steps. I mean, it seems so obvious, but become more. And I, I, some of the things that I've learned, too, is I, it, it, there's always a time, I don't know about you, but there's always a time when you're standing there you don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you, you just don't know what to do, and you can stand there for hours and not come up with it. This seems so simple. But this old, Nick, old guy named Bill Johnson came up to me one time when I was just completely locked up, <laughs> locked up, anxious, fearful. I, I didn't know what to do next. And it's a long story, but I'm standing there, and he walks up behind me, and, he, and he's 77 years old, and he, and he leans over in my ear, and he goes, well, do something even if it's wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that sounds silly, <clears throat> but I learned to do whatever. Yep. Whatever is in your mind that you can do. I don't care if it's so minuscule. That saved me yeah. because I learned take whatever step you can, and then trust the next one will come. Yeah. 
paralysis through analysis is the result of not doing that, right? And right. people stay stuck and then they feel defeated. And I have done entire shows on that. My dad was that 77 year old that you're talking about. Uh, I, he would not tolerate you not jumping into the problem solving process. And so his would do something, even if it's wrong, son, do something, even if it's wrong. But, but in saying that the blessing that he was to us is oftentimes you do the wrong thing. Yeah. And he didn't beat us up. Didn't beat you up. At least you tried. We tried. Like if you just totally created a quagmire, he'd be like, well, let's clean it up. Well, let's, you know, let's keep rolling. Um, and the, so many of us are afraid to fail at anything yeah. these days, whether it's public ridicule we get, or maybe it's going to cost us. And that idea, like s very few things are life and death, yeah. right? Very few things are absolute. Like I'm going to die if this doesn't go right. Yeah. Most of them are just like an inconvenience, an embarrassment or whatever. It's like, you know, at the end of the day, just, just go, just try something. And we throw some spaghetti on the wall and see, see what, what sticks. sticks. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's a that's, it you know that that willingness it, it can burn you. I mean, obviously, yeah. if you max out the company credit card, you <laughs> I know, was just trying. I was trying, and you messed up. You know, that, that's not. <laughs> give smart. me one more credit card. Just I'm, give me. <laughs> I, I'm always amazed at how many we we've I've seen this. It's like, well, if you're going out to get something that's a supply that we need, go ahead and get five of them because we go through this stuff right. all the time. We go through it all. The, no. You know, no, you know, yep. I, he might get up, you know, the owner might get upset. Well, how, how much more upset is he going to be if you drink, make five trips to the store right. and spend five hours yeah. over the course of time? People don't think about, you know, the, the cost of time yeah. and money, you know, at the, the practicality. There's those, those decisions are easy to me. You yeah. just you just get a stock of it while you're there and stick them on the shelf and you're going to go through it. But yeah. I mean, it seems this sounds petty, but it mm. is really uh, alarming to me how many people are afraid of minuscule mistakes possibly. Possibly, right. That in the overall scheme of things mean nothing. Yep. They mean nothing. One of the things this is kind of uh, it's out there, but people don't understand how much the average PO costs. All right. Mm -hmm. So you, when you take a PO in a company, let's say you're a person ordering things, you take that PO from the time you make the order to the time that the person processes it to the time that they pay. Now you think, well, I'll buy this item today and later on to keep the price down. Now I'll do it again over here and I'll save 50 <laughs> bucks. Well, there's like 200 or $300 worth of time in processing that PO. Yeah. So having a, a, an understanding of people's time and how much is involved in the different aspects? I'm going to get Linda to listen to this part of the show. Why? <laughs> well, I don't want to start anything. Well, this is one of our jokes around our house. Um, Linda will go to five different stores across town <laughs> to save a nickel. Yeah. I, and I'm I'm all, I'm kind of exaggerating, but not quite. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's like, and I'm like, hun, I I don't care if it's ten dollars more here. Lock it down and let's get home. Yeah. Just lock it down. It, it really doesn't matter. But there's just that desire that she has to be frugal, right? Yeah. So it's always in good uh, mindset. But it's like, even even if I go home and lay in the recliner, it's what I want to do versus yeah. having to chase all this stuff. Yeah. So I, I don't like, I'm right with you. So just quit worrying about the small things. Do what you need to do and let's move on. Yeah. It, it's, well, you know, and that's, Back to what I said in the first show, know who your boss is, make them happy, make them feel good. There are bosses who can be weird. Yeah. Uh, you you know, spend too much or, yeah. And, and they'll, you know, I've seen it, uh, like $25, they, they have a fit over and then drop $50,000, you know, yeah. or something. So you, you do have that. It's first, you need to know your boss. You need to know the process and look at the thing, but there are a lot of areas that you can clean up and be effect far more efficient in yeah. and help the company by not doing stuff like that, by having, being bold yeah. and saying, you know, and that's, it's, it's, it's just crazy to me. You know, it's like you paid an extra $50 for for shipping mm -hmm. because you wanted to break the order up into two orders so it didn't look so big that doesn't yeah. make sense yeah. you still need the stuff you right know? so <laughs> think i mean this is the the thing and be be willing so one of the things that as far as advancing yourself be loyal mm. and follow the chain of command until you absolutely can't and i'm talking yeah. about somebody who is uh evil or lacks total integrity right um people you need to be loyal i and one of the things i said 
make your boss happy and make them look good. I answered to, to one person, and the, he was the head of a mechanical engineering. And if he wanted something done, and I'm not proud of this. I'm not saying this is the way to do it. But I was, I would, if somebody was standing in the way of that, I would show up in their office with these little cubicles, yeah. you know, U-shaped cubicles. And I, and I was bigger then, and I, and I would literally go in and, and we'd have a little talk. <laughs> and I, and I was very aware of most people don't like their personal space to be invaded. <laughs> so I would lay right on, I mean, uh, we're, we're having this conversation right here and I'd make it clear that's just not going to happen, you know, yeah. or this has got to happen. I'm not saying that's the way to do it, but the principle was what my boss needed. I trusted that it was the right thing to do. That's what I work for him. Right. I am doing that. Uh, and if it's, unless it's something of it, lack of integrity, if it's mm -hmm. causing me to have to lie or anything like that, but uh, short of that, I'm loyal. Yeah. And I'm not going to go around that person because I'm not getting the results or I feel like something's not right. You start that up, you become a person like that, I think you're done. Yeah. I want to stay on the loyalty thing for a, a bit because I'm, I'm right with you. I think that loyalty to the process, right, that means hierarchy of order and all these different things. But I think there's also something that I saw. I'm not sure that I see it as much now. Um, but I would say like when I was in my uh, mid to late 20s, um, it seemed like a lot of guys I knew, and I'll just say in the engineering world, this seemed to be a big deal. A lot of companies were growing and manufacturing was starting to cook back up again. And um, I remember guys talking about, um, I, I use each job for a stepping stone to the next job. Mm -hmm. And so they would put their time in literally two, three years yep. with no intention of ever being no. there. This is only so I can get to, um, I always have my eyes on the next job. Right. And I, I always struggled with that because everyone is just a throwaway to you. Yeah. you. You are just using them for your next step. And I understand bettering yourself and I always want to you know work to better myself. But at the expense of using other people, I always struggled with because um, that means I'm willing to basically dump on anyone if they get in my way. Yeah, there's no loyalty. There's no loyalty to that. And I just think long run, I'd have to, especially from a Christian perspective, I'd have to push back to say, wait a minute, like, are we are we honoring what we've been given? You know, the blessing that came from that? Are we, are we working for our boss, right, yeah. to make him better? Or is this really all about you? Right. And, and I, I think that that comes back to bite you when it's all about you. At some point in time, someone's going to use you and you're going to be really right. offended right. that you were used that way. So I don't know what your take on that is, That's funny. But, but my, I, I always struggle with that. It's like, no, listen, if you're not happy in the job and it's not going well and you're not in the right place, yeah, you got to look on, you got to find that place. But the idea that, Hey, I'm an engineer and I do these things, but I I'm always looking at the next step. Mm, just for my sake for me i was getting out of the shower this morning that's where i do most of my thinking it's either there or in the windshield behind the windshield of the car going in. so in this morning i was thinking about and nobody knows who this is it's fred and years ago 35 40 years ago when i moved to cincinnati i met him at a party with a good friend of mine who's still a friend of mine and he was a jumper and he was his philosophy was you just you you would you would advance yourself by jumping companies you mm -hmm. know so every two years he was jumping companies and I personally, I've hired people and looked at, and, and for me, I'm not, these were higher up positions he was talking about. For me, I'd look at it and go, if somebody is jumping a lot, I'm not interested because right. I, I'm going to, I'm going to put a lot of effort into them. And I'm thinking, why are you moving around so much? And I don't really want to invest in you at a certain point. You don't understand their circumstances to do it, but Fred was doing it. Unfortunately, it ended up not well. Yeah. He got to a point where I think his reputation preceded him mm -hmm. and he ended up uh basically unemployed for a lot of years at the toward the end of his life he was much older and he had made some good money he had made some big money so there's i guess that side of it but i i don't i don't advocate that and i, I think a lot of people who do that this is just my opinion um, they, they garnish their resumes mm -hmm. in ways that may not always be so accurate they make themselves look like more than they are because they don't have that 
that following necessarily. It's like, I did this and I've seen that happen. And then they go to this and you look at their resume and you see the position. We had somebody that worked with us do that. I'm thinking that person was nothing like that. They yeah. had none of those abilities. They knew the terms, mm -hmm. but they were trying to better. Then it didn't really work out yeah. long term. You'll you'll be found out unless, yeah. unless you know. Well, the, the loyalty is all to yourself. Yeah. Right. And yeah. it's that self loyalty. And um, our son right now is working fast food, and and he's said this multiple times. And I don't, I don't know what he's making 10, 11 bucks an hour, which that blows my mind. But anyway, he's making that money, and he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to quit because uh, this restaurant down there, they're they're doing twelve dollars an hour. I mean, that's what it says right there on the sign. And I'm like, you don't have my support. You don't have my support to do that. You're moving yeah. for a, a dollar yeah. and you're staying in fast food. Yeah. How about you work on the relationships that you have here and build build something that these people might, they might actually add to your resume. Your manager, your boss might say, hey, this guy was amazing. He was yeah. sold out to the company. He was good versus you jumping for a dollar. And, uh, but he, he's, I don't know what he's going to do at the end of the day, you know, but I'm like, son, it's just, it's just not, it's not going to pan out well. Well, <laughs> for a dollar. <laughs> and, I, and I say, and I, I may be all wet. I, I've, I've been, and one of the things I want to talk about is asking for raises, but I, I, if you're a stud, uh, there isn't, I can't imagine anybody letting you get away. Right. If the, if the, if the fast food joint up the street is paying $12 an hour and you're a stud, yeah. I mean, I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the average person that shows up. We were at a McDonald's the other day and I thought, is there, <laughs> is, is everybody in slow motion? Yeah. I mean, it just, there was no enthusiasm. Yeah. You know, when you come to mm -hmm. the, the, it's like, I guarantee you, I, and, and maybe you think, well, why would you want to do that anyway? You you drop me in a McDonald's. First of all, it it, it it's I'm going to be unpopular. That's something I want to talk about. Um, if you're going to be a stud, you better get ready. Yeah, because most people would rather pull you down mm -hmm. than to see you rise. And I was very fortunate early on to have to walk a gauntlet every day for four years have people who were upset people, right. because I had gotten a position that was never offered to anybody else. It was made yeah. for me. So I learned, but if you are a stud, you should be able to go to the owner or the boss and say, listen, they're paying down here. I really like working here. I like the people, everything like that. But you know, and if they don't pony up that, it would surprise me. Well, and it might say something that you're not the stud. That's you the other side. I said, yeah. if you're a stud, not an, yeah. not a stud in your head, right. but you're a stud. So Yeah. Well, let's keep rolling because yeah. time is rolling. Yeah. So what are some of your other... I'll uh, tell you the big one that I, I stumbled across uh, years ago, and hopefully this coming across here. In the Fortune 500 companies, they did a study, and it just hit me upside the head, of the president, CEOs, all right? What do you think was the number one and only consistent factor among all the the Fortune 500 CEOs they studied um, well, for their success? I'll put it that way. Well, the things that I mean, there's I've looked looked at those lists many times, and one of the things I always drift on is self discipline. Um, is one of the reasons why they got where they are. They they keep themselves in line. They don't let their flesh and their feelings run them. So that's where I would go with that, that that's okay. what they have in common. They have a lot of self-discipline. Okay, that might not have been on the list that I read because it might not be measurable, mm -hmm. okay? Right. The number one factor they said that they had in common wasn't college. It wasn't the degrees and things like that. It was a great command and broad vocabulary. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I don't care what you do in life. Um, I don't care if you're married. I don't care if you're in a poker club. I don't care if you're in a church mm -hmm. or you're in a job. The ability to communicate effectively. Mm -hmm. And I watch today that a lot of these people are doing um, texting and they're doing these abbreviations and things like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, the the uh, that talent is disappearing yeah the command of the english language and you're in sales i don't care what i just listed there you're in sales and marketing now mm -hmm. you, people always say i was always amazed that people say well i don't like sales i think you've even said that yeah but in effect you're in sales all the time right when you're in the work environment and you and you have an idea or you're trying to advance a project or you're trying to flesh something out with a team of people you may have the right idea, but if you can't express it, 
Right. And if you can't move people, if you're going to be in leadership, you have to be able to move people. You have to be able to inspire and initiate people. And the way you do that, you can do it with a stick. That doesn't usually work very long. Right, right. Or you can do it with words. You can convey yourself in a way that people understand, integrate into their, and take into themselves, and then are active about it. That is a gift. It is a gift. So I, 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 I hear you completely, and I want to push back a little bit. Sure. Because those were the CEOs, and those guys were probably having a lot of those gifts. I work with a lot of guys who are in the trades. Right. One of the things I struggle or they struggle with and, and why they come to me um, because they're maybe struggling in their marriage or whatever is – they can't can't communicate, and that's right? my point. I'm not saying just CEOs. If I don't care what you're in, this is a to, thing. To this is develop, develop, this. right? Develop this. Yeah. I, in fact, I'd say, you know, maybe there's a software you need to learn. If you're one of these guys you're talking about, right? Uh, there might be something you need to learn that would immediately change your position. But long term, you know, when uh, Johnson O'Connor, one of the things they gave up there was a book of words. Mm-hmm. and new words to add to your vocabulary. And it's, so I would say the meat, uh, if you really want to change your destiny, is to become proficient in this area. Mm-hmm. Be, uh, it ties everything else together, I right. believe. Well, yeah. let me just, let me give some simple on this. Sure. This is simple. Um, look at people in the eye. Oh. In our culture, that still is revered as good, right? I know yeah. in other cultures, maybe not so much. Um, But looking people in the eye, not staring with a dead stare, but looking people in the eye, all right, Uh, having your head up and speaking loud enough, not yelling, but speaking loud enough and clear, enunciate your words, right? right? Those things are huge. They are huge. When I, (laughs) my hearing's bad anyway, and when I have a guy who won't look at me and he's kind of staring at the ground and he's mumbling, I say, well, we got to stop right here. We got to stop because I know why your wife's mad right now. I know why your marriage is struggling. And so these are things that, you know, we would have liked to have been taught when they were eight and nine and 10 years old. Did your dad teach you how to shake a hand? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like my dad was like, son. And my dad, if we answered a phone, oh, he, he, <laughs> he grabbed the phone and hit you in the head where they're like, yeah. speak up, you know. But these are things that can be taught. They don't have to be a gift. They can be taught and then practiced. And you know, I, and that young young boys, I still shake their hands and everything. And I had not too long ago, a boy just stick his hand. Eh, that's not good enough. Yeah, yeah. Come on, son. And and uh, I said, and I, the whole eye contact thing. Right. You know, to have the confidence. And this, it's just you have to. Sometimes I feel like we're telling people how to manipulate people. It's not that. It's that you are. You need to project this confidence. People are drawn to that. Yeah. Well, you're presenting what God made of you. Right. Versus hiding. And that's a big responsibility. I think that, I don't remember the exact title, but it was called like the first five seconds. Mm -hmm. And they talk about how a person's, right or wrong, a person's perception of you is formed like Like that. that. Yeah. Yeah. So you walk up and and put a dead fish hand in somebody, in man's hand, you know, and, and not look at him and not make eye contact. Right there. If you're doing that, you need to you need to fix that. And if you if you need help on that, come see one of us. We'll work with you on that. But a firm handshake, not a killer, but a firm handshake and looking a man in the eye, uh, so important from yeah. that standpoint. Now, on that, let's talk about raises. <laughs> because I've learned that I've been thing. going to my boss for the last year and it's, it's not work. So help me out. Uh, but <laughs> my boss is, is <laughs> yeah, I know who she is, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm her boss. You're, too. you're on so your she, own. She hasn't got yeah. a raise either. So no, it's, 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 <laughs> kick it back and forth. But second to the last raise I asked for, and this was on, and I'm, I'm not saying this to brag, but the second to the last raise that I asked for, was on the heels of several others. I talked about in the first one buying the the tutorial for sixty dollars that made a twenty thousand dollar difference over the next two years of my life, which yeah. was a huge percentage. So along that way, I started going in and asking for raises. And I joked because the owner of the company, I said he was getting to the point when I knocked Here on comes his door. Carl. When I knocked on his door, he flinched, you know. So on the heels of that, the second to the last one, I walked in and I sat down, and I said, uh, I think it's time for a raise. He says, so what do you got in mind? (laughs) And I said, 25%. 
Wow. Yeah. <laughs> the, when you pulled him up off the floor, how'd it go? This is what we did. Yeah. And back and forth, just stared at each other. <laughs> and there's an old saying, he who talks first loses. Yeah. I don't know if that's true or not. But, I, you know, so many people, I'm a believer that you need to push that envelope You'll get a sense if you're if you're a deliverer, and I and I believe I am. I think that's shown that just from these kinds of things. You'll get a sense for where the pain threshold is, mm-hmm. where it's workable for both of you. All yeah. right, I'm just going to say it again: no committee's meeting to make your life better. They're trying to do their best. They're not bad people. They're trying to put as much money in their pocket or reserves or whatever it is. I understand that, but you, you, you need to, you, if you are, and you're delivering and you are more worth more each time you do this. Yeah. So we sat and stared at each other. I didn't <laughs> say a word. It went on and it seems like an eternity. It went on for at least a minute Yeah. that we just, we sat there. Too many people go into that situation and they are not feeling confident and they start, they start backpedaling. They start, well, they start talking and taking it. Well, away. why don't you think about it? And I'll, I'll walk out now. Yeah, or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Or that's you know, it's, I understand. It's not, you know, it's, I just we just and so he said, uh, let me see what what I can do. Yeah. Okay. And I got up and I left, and I came back. Did I tell you this? I have heard. Oh, all right, I'm yeah. sorry. You're good, but they but they have heard. It's still it's yeah. still for you. And I, and I came back and he said, well, we can do 15. And mm-hmm. I said, oh, that'll work. And I knew that was the line. Right. That was the line at that time. That's we're done. Right. And uh, then he looked at me and said, you know, that took a lot of sack. And yeah. I said, yeah. It, <laughs> it did. Point is, though, it, it just if you are a doer, I think this is one of the areas that people, because they don't feel good about themselves or they don't believe in themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, if you are a doer, you know, in a workplace, pretty much. If you're a shaker and a mover and you're the go-to person, I believe you need to be known if you really want to advance in anything right. as the person that comes through in the clutch. And there's a situation, you take it. And uh, it, it, it's too many people, I think, just don't feel good about themselves and they never ask. You're well, the, probably worth more than you're being paid in general. Uh, the risk of doing what you just talked about there is uh, which is like I want people to welcome the risk, and the risk is, um, but now I gotta perform. You know now yeah. now they paid me this, and so now it gives your boss sure. like if he's gonna watch even closer the numbers of production, and so now when he's like, you're not you're not what you are, um, or what we agreed basically through the money speaking that. Uh, you he can come back at you and again like that's not a bad thing because we're both no. rising the this tides is a, here this is a deal you're yeah. making a deal with a yeah. man yeah no different than if you shake his hand you're saying i i will deliver i deliver and i'm gonna yeah so some people might i hope nobody would say well i get to that point then i can coast no nope, that's not the deal you just what you're saying there is i'm taking on more responsibility you know, right. even in doing this, I understand what's being what's going to be asked of me, and right. I accept that. So, if you're not willing to do that, if you're not willing to live up to your end of the bargain by being worth more, right. you know, and, and being paid more, then don't do it. I yeah. mean, that's that's the bottom line. It's like saying I, I wanted, but I believe that a lot of people don't could better themselves in life. They're they're a lot with their families and their ability. You know, the, like I said, with college and things like that, simply because they just have never asked. You yeah. Know, they just have, they've just gone. And I'll say this too. Um, and you know who he is. His initials are ZS. I won't say his name because I mm-hmm. don't know if he'd want me to say it. Called me up and said, Oh, they're getting ready to, to, and I don't remember exactly how he put it, but the department's, you know, turning over and I don't have such and such a degree and I won't qualify for this and i said and i knew him and i said you're a stud and i've always told him that mm-hmm. i said you're a stud and if you're anything there like i've known you to be those rules mean nothing right a lot of yeah. companies and this is my opinion a lot of companies hide behind these rules right so they say well you don't have this that and the other i have seen too many times in my life people and he ended up being he's a department head or something now mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um I've seen too many times where there, you know, it requires a degree or it requires this, that, and the other. But if you're, if you can bring it, 
they'll they'll move mountains. I yeah. mean, that's generally true. Uh, yeah, it, it's well, you you bring something to them, right? You yeah. set their apart their department uh, uh, apart or profitability or whatever. So I think, I think that's really important to realize. I think we have gotten maybe uh, maybe a little less in the last five or six years when we're starting to see the um, the drop in value of the college education. Yeah, and now we're starting to see companies say. Just show me what you can do. I yeah. don't care about your degree. And we're starting to see a move back towards that, which that should encourage us to say, man, this is about me producing. And I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't have the paper, but that's yeah. fine. So. That, that reminds me, I don't think it's made me the same, but I remember hearing a story about a guy watching a the show Jeopardy. Mm-hmm. With, do you know that story? No, he's, I know the show. <laughs> yeah, he's watching the store. He's watching the show Jeopardy, and this, you know, like what that Ken, whatever that guy's name is on, or somebody like that, it's just bam, bam, bam. He's yeah. listening, to, you know. So, and the CEO looked at the other guy. He said, "You know how much I'd pay for this? This is going. This is dated. You know how much I'd pay for a guy like that?" He, and the other guy said, "No." He said, "About eleven hundred dollars." He said, "The price of an encyclopedia set." Mm. You know, just because you have a lot of knowledge, right? you know, facts and things like that, that doesn't translate into, you can't, I, I'll say this. I think one of the factors you asked me in the first, what was the thing for my work ethic? Right. I was headed to college when it was interrupted and I chose to be apprenticed by the two men. Right. I've never had a degree mm-hmm. and I've always, I've worked in a lot of places. I was in the engineering department you know, and I, and everybody had degrees. The people that I work with where I work now, a lot of them had design degrees. I don't have a degree. So a lot of it, I felt early on, I had to bring more, right? I didn't have a degree to rely on. And mm-hmm. I think sometimes people, if you're one of those people, you think the degree is going to open doors and do all this. It may, it may open doors for you, but you got to deliver. You got to produce. You yeah. got to deliver. So I think for me, that was one of the things that really drove another part of that work. I think one, I felt insecure, but two, because I didn't have a degree, I knew I had to. I knew I had to come with more. I had right. to be more just to overcome people's perceptions. So. Yeah, it's something that we're going to start to wind down on some yeah. time here. But there's something I do want to bring up as another trait that uh, I think is really important, and that is um, adaptability. Oh yeah adaptability to not just flex within a certain job and role, but to take on roles that maybe are not in the job description. And I I say this as simple as if you're walking through, uh, if you're going to the bathroom and there's uh, water all over the bathroom floor, (laughs) clean it up. The bouncing ball metaphor. There's a bouncing ball, grab it. Grab it, right. And and so a lot of us get trapped into um, our our job description, our department, uh, what we were hired for. Or that's beneath me. Or beneath me, right? right, all these things. And it's like, you know, at the end of the day, if you want to make yourself, if you want to improve your lot in, in the corporation, in the business, whatever it is, man, if a broom needs to be grabbed, grab it. If the garbage needs to be dumped, dump it. If if somebody needs some IT help and you happen to have uh, that, again, it's it, you do have to stay in your lane, right? I think there's yeah. a place to stay in your lane. Yeah. You're not fixing everybody. You're not the savior of the company. Well, if you don't have any real ability in it, you better be careful. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But uh, that idea that you would go out of your lane a little bit to see a job that needs to be done that you're capable of in doing it. And I, I just think, man, this is that, um, you become the Swiss army knife yeah. of the corporation of the company and every company, every, every place needs a Swiss army knife. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I've, I've said that's a thing I'd formulated 35 years ago, the great somebody. There's no great somebody. Right. And I, you know, I'd walk by a piece of trash on the ground. You know, it's like, so there's somebody, somebody, there's somebody Somebody's supposed to pick, pick that up, up. Yeah. You know, like the garbage people or whatever it is. That's true all the way across the board. There's no great somebody. And yeah. when, you know, I'm always, I was always impressed with the former owner that with the toilet overflowed, he had the, he had the mop out. Right. And we have a guy that, that's it's his job. That's mm-hmm. his job. But boy, Tom would be right in there and, He's cleaning up. There was nothing beneath him. That, that, you know, he understood yeah. that you got to do everything to make it work. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think we've covered we've, a great deal here. Yeah, there's a lot. I, I do. Uh, there's another side, too, of, and maybe I'm just going to use this word, um, but um, teamwork. Oh, yeah. Uh, being a team player. Some of our jobs were more by ourselves, but a lot of uh, things... A lot, a lot of jobs mean collaboration, yeah. 
And that idea that um, collaboration means you collaborate, you don't dictate. And I think if we, if some of us that might be, you know, we're talking about studs, sometimes the ego gets out in front yeah. and they have to be a driver to get their way, right? And I think ultimately, if you're going to serve well, you're able to hear ideas. You're able to, to help use discernment and bring people to the table. Like, you know, the, you should never be the smartest guy at the table, right? You should invite more people and say, well, I don't know. Like, let's figure it out. So I think teamwork is, is huge. And I just think um, a lot of people who don't feel comfortable um, don't want to be part of the team or they want to dictate how the whole team's going to go. Yeah. Like, so somewhere in that middle is just, just be a player in there. Yeah. Well, and I'd say one of my faults is I, I don't always have patience. Because I, I will get on a task, and I know what needs to be done. And when people, when I work with other people on that, I have to be. You got to be understanding that not everybody has the same abilities. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the great things that we fall into is we expect everybody to be the same. The two old guys that taught me said, you know, some people are meant to be production workers. Right. They're just meant for that. And some people are meant to be owners and some people are meant to be leaders or whatever it is. When you get into and you're in the heat of the moment and you got a tight deadline, we always have these tight deadlines and you've got a budget you're trying to hit. It's really easy for me at times to lose my patience and expect uh, others to understand how I'm thinking, especially yeah. when I'm driving a job mm -hmm. and to go along with that. And you gotta be careful about that. That's probably one of the biggest mistakes I've made over my, the mm. course of where I, what I'm doing right now is, is not being patient enough that way and expecting people to think, you know, they understand what needs to be done. They don't, yeah. they don't always do yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, as you're talking, I'm thinking about, being patient, um, but then also if you if you're going to agree to pull people around a table to talk, then um, you have to hear them. Yep. Right, and that's where you, what you were talking there triggered me. Like, if I already have my idea, I know how this. And I know to how to done. do this, but I just pulled these people around yeah. and said, "What do you guys think?" And then I really pretty much get up and figuratively walk away and go do what I want. You you really broke your team. Why yeah. did you even call us? Yeah. Why? So if you're if you're going to have the team, then even at the cost, like sometimes I say in marriage work, it's like you know what, guys. At the end of the day, th there could be two ways to do something. One might be a little righter than the other, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Choose a way and go. Yeah. Choose a way and go because unity is more important than you getting your way. Unity for many jobs. Yeah, and you want to break unity. Um, I had a rule for all the people that work for me at Cincinnati Microwave. It's my responsibility. If one of my people failed and did something mm. that was poor or that didn't work or was wrong, I did it. That's right, yeah. And that by the same token, I didn't, I didn't throw them under the bus and I expected, and I made it very clear that they were to answer to me and nobody else was to take them off task except my boss. Mm -hmm. So I protected them and I made it clear that if somebody, we used to have this battle between production and, and, and engineering and the people in production, would they wanted that area under their control and they would come in and they'd, they'd try to get one of my people to do something for them. Mm. And we had a deadline, we had, if, if, if it didn't shut down production, it wasn't a priority. I don't right. know if this makes sense or not, but I made it clear that's not your responsibility. You just, you know, put them to me, tell them to see me, and I insulated my people, and I took the responsibility. Right. Yeah. If you want, if you want to bust it up, don't take responsibility. It's going back to what I think I said in the first video: happiness is knowing who to blame. If you're one of those people that's that's, well, it's their fault, or they didn't this, that, and the other, or if only they would do this especially if they're people that work for you, you're done. Yeah. You're, you're toast. They'll find a way to put a knife in your back. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you're not loyal to them. You're not right? loyal to them. Yeah. You got to be loyal. You got you've got to be known as a person that's loyal from that standpoint and take responsibility when you order something you shouldn't order, when you mess a job up, when you didn't understand the communication, you can sit and say, well, they didn't make it clearer than the other. The end result is it didn't get done. Yeah. Or, or it's, and you played a role in that and you got to accept that. If you do that,
people will trust you. Yeah. You know, that yeah. standpoint. I got one more. Shoot. I got one more. Um, I, I'm you, I'm going to use the word professionalism. I think you could probably tweak out a few different words on this, yeah. but professionalism and um, professionalism to me is that idea that you, you work within the understanding of, of being um, who you're called to be uh, and honoring, that, respecting that position. Okay. And so what comes to my mind with it a lot of times is, um, you know, I, in the last 15 years, we've gotten casual business attire. Yeah. We've gotten very laxed with some of the things that you used to, would never cut it before. Yeah. And um, so the idea here is, you know what, I'll grow my hair as long as I want because I, I don't really care. And uh, I'll wear whatever I want because, you know, if I'm that good, you'll take me. And I, I caution that attitude because it's now about you, isn't it? It's about you. And so professionalism yeah. means I'm going to put the profession ahead of me, right? And uh, so um, I think it's really important. And unless you own the company, you want to run it your own way. When you are trying to work through, you look at what the standard is. Whatever the, the company has provided, the, here's what we want you to look like. Here's, you know, here's what our customer's like. Um, here's how we want you to talk. You, you, that is your minimum, that you shoot for. And if you're like, well, I'm not talking that way. Well, yeah. now it's about you. Now it's about you. Yeah. Right. And I really do struggle with that. It's like, I know I'm going to really step on toes here, oh. but when I go into fast food and I see, oh, I, I know see where you're the going. crazy piercings and I see the hair and I see all this, I'm like, I'm sorry, you're representing something. And now all of that is about you. And I didn't come here to get your tattoos and your piercings. I didn't come here. I came for food, yeah. good quality food. And when you have to take the time, you won't cover that over top of your profession. I struggle with that. So I, yeah. I'll probably get a oh, little feedback yeah, on we're, that. But we're in a whole different era, you know. That, yeah. that it's just I, I'm with you. I go in there and I'm at a burger joint and then they got the nose thing and they've got the tattoos and everything. I, you know, if you're in customer service, I think a, a middle of the road kind of thing is, but it, 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 let's just back it up. Unless you're being asked to do something immoral. Yeah. When you go to work for somebody, what you're saying is, I agree to, to do what you ask me to do. Right. That means you're not in charge. Mm -hmm. Now, you may have an opinion and you may, and you, and I think one of the things I had on here is don't be a brown noser. And no, nowhere in here am I talking about being a brown noser. You may be perceived that way, but when I talk about brown nosers, I'm talking about the yes people right. who are simply just being false, phony. They're not delivering. They just want to get to a role and position. I heard a guy one time being so distraught that he didn't get a management position because the other guy got to the next guy in line and sold him the cocaine instead of Don. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. that's your qualification? <laughs> you think that you should have done this? So, you know, I, it was it, those, those, those brown nosers yeah. from that standpoint that, that, that sell themselves out and be so phony and false. When I'm talking about you partner with somebody, but you still got to subvert your desires yep. if this is what they're asking you to do you go well that's not really the other side nope nope you're not in charge yep. until you're signing the checks you don't have you that's know right. and that's tough a lot of people today don't you know it's like i'm an individual and you should be oh, here we go tolerant <laughs> accepting whatever it is i don't agree with that well and let's bring this all the way back to <clears throat> our christian faith the hardest thing about the christian faith is submission submission Submission, but submission, you're submitting, you're, you're putting, yeah, the pride says, I, uh, I am on top, I'm on the throne. And that whole idea, like, if, if we don't teach our kids to submit, if we don't practice submission, appropriate submission, right? Not slavery, appropriate submission, like, hey, this is your house. I'll do how you want to do in your house. This is your business. Th this is Christ. This is the way he's shown the way. Uh, his way is far better than mine. I will submit. And that whole practice of submission is that humility. And I think one thing that we didn't mention in all of this, we want confidence in, in all of these young guys we're talking yeah. to, but we want humility. Humility comes from the idea that are you teachable? Are you coachable? Right. Are you coachable? 
you went out and bought a, a, a little software and you, you coached yourself because you wanted to learn more. But at the end of the day, if we have this arrogance yep. of saying, you know, I already got this. I don't really need this. You need me more than I need you. That's not who we're supposed to be as Christians. And that, you know, we were talking the other night, a group of us talking about there's the rich and then there's the nickel millionaires. The nickel millionaires are, they may have a million dollars or whatever it is, but they're, they're unstable, they're insecure, they're constantly fearful or whatever it is. They're not really rich. Right. Because I don't know if that makes any right. sense. In, yeah. in the work environment, if you truly are a stud, you don't need to be arrogant, cocky, bossy, uh, proud. Yeah. You just do your deal. Do your job, and yeah. one of the things I said in that first video that, you know, if you're, if you're walking around going, you know, it took me a while to realize if the owner of the company wants to pay somebody to sit there and pick their nose all day <laughs> while I am busting my butt up to my arms in, in difficulties, right. that's their right. That's the, the parable of the, the, the crop workers, the, the, right? The vineyard, workers, vineyard workers. In the yeah. vineyard. Yeah. And it took, it, you know, it, if you're a stud, especially, that can be tough. Mm -hmm. You know, you, if your, your ego's in the way and everything like that, but you're working for God. Mm -hmm. And this is what this owner or this company has asked you to do. Yeah. This is your job, like it or not. And if they want to pay them to do that over there, that's the way it is. And yeah. I think that's some of that what we're talking about, yeah. is subverting that ego. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Carl, we have thrashed and trashed <laughs> everything we can. If you can't do better in your lot in life after the last two shows, I ain't got nothing for you. <laughs> no, no, and uh, I really do. I said it at the end of the first one. I, st I still say that there's just a lot of meat here, a lot of solid stuff if yeah. you take it into the workplace. And always, you got to understand God's in control. You know, a lot of the things we're talking about here is what you can do, and I, I believe God moves us to do certain things. Yeah. If it's on your heart, the biggest thing is it, it, so many times people don't know what they're not, what they don't know. Yeah. So yeah. hopefully you now you know. Yeah. So. All right, guys, we do. We want to thank you. If we can help you in any way, again, I'll have you reach out to rocksolidfamilies.org or give us give the office a call, 812-576-7625. I want to thank our sponsors. Yeah. I don't know if I thanked our sponsors at the front of oh, our we show have. here. We were so anxious so to get into it. I'll, I'll say this quite. <laughs> thanks, Quality Auto Mart. Thanks, Quality Auto Mart. Thanks, <laughs> Casey's Outdoor <laughs> Solutions. Thanks, Four Speed on 50. You guys get the drift there. So we do. We want to be thankful. We also do want to thank our Lord and savior yes. we want to thank uh the gifts that we have the blessings we have and the opportunity that we have and i think as you just said like at the end of the day we work for for the lord and so guys um i think that's all we got for you car you got anything no thank you for listening if you listened this far hopefully this helps you yeah so go out there and be a strong dad Strong Dads wants to thank Quality Auto Mart and Service for being a proud sponsor of the Strong Dads podcast. Started in 1985 and going strong for all these years. Recently, Quality Auto Mart has transitioned from owners of Mark and Nancy Repke to longtime employee Fred and Lorreen Venus. For all your automotive needs and golf cart needs, Check out Quality Auto Mart, located across from Indian Lakes on Highway 46 outside of Batesville, Indiana. Casey's is a premier garden center and gift shop located in Lawrenceburg, Indiana. Casey's offers a wide selection of plants, landscaping materials, home and garden decor, and gifts for every occasion. Casey's is committed to providing exceptional service, a unique shopping experience, and value to every customer. Stop in and see what makes Casey's so unique. Located at 21481 State Line Road, Lawrenceburg, Indiana, or call 812-537-3800. Let Casey's help you add beauty to your home.